Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Secrets to Seed Beads, Episode 4. We're having a great time with this 10-part series. I hope you're enjoying and learning some great things. Now, in Episode 3, you learned how to make this amulet bottle. Very fun, using fringe bre fringes and net stitch. And this episode, we're going to make a loomed heart bracelet. And I'm going to teach you all about it. Let's go. All right, it all starts with some graph paper. And this is a free downloadable pattern. You can get it at firemountaingems.com. There's lots of different kinds of graph paper. This one happens to be for the seed bead square or loom work graph. And once you've got this, time to get a handful of colored pencils and go to town. I have an advantage in that after I did it with all the colored pencils, I have this really great graphic designer team that did all the, did it nice for me. So here's a pretty version of it. And when you look up the instructions for this design, you can also get that pattern if you like. Or you can make your own pattern using your own graph paper and your own colored pencils. Go anywhere you want. Mostly I want you to know how to work a loom. The loom I'm using, I call it the purple one. <laughs> It's a clover loom. This is, happens to be one of my favorites. So this is the one I'm going to use. And the first thing I'm going to show you is how to warp the loom. Warping the loom is when we put the threads back and forth across here. So I'm going to use my fire line, which as most people know now is one of my favorites. Sometimes I'll use Nymo because it uses quite a lot of threads. So I like to go, sometimes I like to just go affordable. And the first thing to do is grab your thread and make any kind of knot. I just do a little slip knot. Anything that'll attach that little peg right there. Now, in this loom kit, they've got more instructions on how to work it and lots of fancier stuff. Um, there's even a little clampy thing that's gonna hold the tail of this thread for you. Um, I'm kind of low tech. I grabbed a piece of scotch tape and I just tape it down. <laughs> it works for me. <laughs> you don't have to be so fancy and high tech all the time. So now, uh, on this loom, there are these little teeth, these nifty little teeth right here, uh, and they're to hold your thread. And the nice thing about this loom, the teeth are very close together, but you can pick your size. So if you're using a bigger seed bead, you might just put your thread in every other tooth. And this one, we're going to use size 11 Toho beads. So I'm going to make these, put these on every tooth. And my pattern happens to be 15 beads wide. I'll start there, it's a good place as any. Happens to be 15 beads wide. Since there's going to be 15 beads, I'm going to need 16 threads because the beads go between the threads. So I put, I've attached my thread here. I'm going to throw this on the floor because I don't need it on my table. And I will go back and forth warping the loom. It's one thread around the pin on this end. And also because this is a bracelet, it's gonna take a lot of wear and tear. So I like to double the outside thread. So I'm gonna go right the same path on the outside for the first one. So I've done two threads on that first one and we need a total of 16. So I'm gonna go into the next path. This is tougher. <laughs> <laughs> Three. Four, and it's just back and forth into each tooth around the peg at the end and People find this really frustrating. I just easy, easy breezy back and forth. Oops, see, I went too far. There we go. And don't worry about it being too loose or too tight because we have a way to tighten it up after we get it all loomed. There's also in this loom kit, when you purchase one of these, 
There's also a special little keeper wire that once you get it loomed, you can string that keeper wire through here to keep any of your threads from falling out. I find with this loom, the teeth are deep enough that it's not an issue, so I just don't bother. So how many have I done? Are you all counting out there? Let's see. Before you tie it off, make sure you count it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Fifteen, sixteen, and because that is an outside one, I will double it for a little extra strength. And then I'm going to count again. Count twice. What? What is it? Count twice. Cut once. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay, and now I want to tie this off. And you can tie any kind of fancy knot you want. I'm just, I just wrap around a couple times, grab myself another piece of tape. Low tech. Done. And trim that off. Note when I trim fire line, I almost always use these nippers because this fire line is so tough. Scissors doesn't work really well, so I use these nippers. Ta-da! And there we have a fully warp loom. Now it's a little bit loose. So to tighten up this loom, notice we've got knobs here on the side. All I have to do is loosen the knobs and pull this a little tighter just by rotating this little gizmo here, rotating it tighter and tighten up the knobs again. Much nicer. Okay, so from there, we need to start looming. We are good to go. So let's get started with this looming. I should point out the, th the items I'm going to be using. I'm using Fireline thread, of course, a needle that is at least as long as the piece I'm looming. I'm using an assortment of size 11 Toho beads. Now, I like a size 11 bead. Uh, for this one in particular, I chose Tohos because they're a very round bead, and I wanted a nice um, uh, sort of handmade, not so perfect as like a Delica. Delicas are a cylinder seed bead, and they're much more perfect and precise. And they look really beautiful, but I wanted a sort of handmade, I did it myself sort of look on this. So I'm going to use the toe hose. And of course, on the end, we're going to have some ribbon ends. We're going to use a clasp. We're going to have some chain. I'm even going to use a charm as well, a heart-shaped charm. But we'll get to those things as we move along. First off, I want you to know how to do the looming. First thing I'm going to do is I've got my needle and thread here. This will be the weft thread. The thread that's going up and down, this is the warp thread. And what I'm working with here is going to be the weft. Warp and weft. It can be important. And I'm going to tie just a knot. I'm going to tie a knot first on the edge to make sure I don't lose my thread. You know, you could be looming along and just pull that puppy right out. So I'm just going to tie a quick double knot and leave myself a good tail because you usually want to sew this back in. In this case, I've got a sneaky way to finish this loom work. You're going to like it. <laughs> okay, so the first thing in my pattern is a row of 15 yellow seed beads. So there we go. Pick up 15. You get to do all 15 at once. So pick up 15 seed beads. One of the things I like about looming is I get to do a whole row all at once, unlike like peyote stitch where you do one bead at a time. These go underneath the loom, and there's one bead between each thread. And using whichever finger is easiest for you, you're going to press those beads up, up through your warp threads so that you can actually hear the beads click into place. These are now in between all the warp threads. In fact, if I take my fingers away, 
this will almost hold itself in place. Almost, it didn't quite, darn it. There we go, so I'm going to click those back into place. The first row is the hardest one, like all seed beads. Stay where I'm telling you to. And like all seed beads, you are the master. You make them do what you want them to do. You're in charge. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pull that needle through, keeping my finger in place. So the seed beads stay where they are, but I'm pulling the thread through. Now I have to go back through the same holes, but this time I want to make sure I'm staying on top of the warp thread. So I'm sort of angling my needle up toward the top of that seed bead hole. And if anything doesn't want to behave, I push it and make it do what I want it to. So those are now locked in place. These beads cannot come out because I've got a piece of thread going under and a piece of thread going over, holding those beads in place. And that's the essence of looming beads, is getting the top and bottom in place. Pull that tight there. There you have it. Now these should be able to slide up and down your loom even. And that's one way you know you haven't accidentally pierced any of your warp threads. That's pretty tricky too. Making sure you don't pierce the warp threads. Uh, occasionally you do, but ideally never pierce the warp threads. So we do another row, pick up 15 more seed beads. According to my pattern, I do four rows of plain yellow seed beads. And like I've shown in earlier videos, you can mark off those rows as you go along um, so you don't lose track of your pattern. Patterns are handy. How many do I got there? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. There's all 15 for my next row. And the second rows are so much easier. They just pop right into place usually. They won't because I said that. <laughs> there we go. Pop that row into place. Make sure it's pushed up between the threads, between the warp threads. Pull it through. Slowly and gently. And then go back along the tops of the seed beads. Kind of angling up. Of course, I'm very close, so I can actually literally see my needle going between the threads, between the beads, that I know I've got them attached properly. Pull that through. There we go. One, one row at a time. It's very, it's actually pretty darn quick because you get to do a whole row at once, not one bead at a time like much seed beading is. And after you keep on going with this, I'm going to show you where you get to. Oh look! Magic! <laughs> yes, I've moved along on this pattern, but I also switched colors on you. This was yellow and now it's pink. Sorry, <laughs> but I have been following my pattern. And here's my pattern, and this is where we are right now. That's the last row I did. And now I'm going to put this row in place. And I've already picked up all the seed beads I need based on my pattern. So there's three pinks that would have been yellows originally, <laughs> three of the greens, another pink. Uh, a turquoise, a pink, three greens, and then three more pinks. And I'll press that up between my rows here, between my warp threads. I should use the correct terminology. Pull it through. Doesn't this make you want to do some looming? First time I saw this, I thought this was like really magical. I did not know how those beads were held in place. So it's just one weft thread underneath, one weft thread on the top. Locks it all in place. There we go. And that's another row done. The next row is one, two, three, four, five, six of the pinks, which I forgot I changed colors. I do need some different beads out here then. Pinks. Six of the pinks. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then I need three of the turquoise. One, come on, one, two, three, and six more pinks. One, two, three, four, 
five, six. And there's a whole nother row ready to go. Now you could watch me do this for a couple hours, I suppose, until I get to the end of the bracelet. Or we could do some more video magic and go to the end of the project. So let me go through this one here. Oops, see those don't want to be on top. There we go. All locked in place. No beard, no be no threads have been pierced. Beards have been feast. I don't know what I was trying to say. No threads were pierced. Okay, let's move on to the end of this project and show you what to do next. So here I have a bracelet nearly complete. In fact, I've already put one end on, but I want you to know what to do with all these darn warp threads at the end. There are lots of different ways that these can be dealt with. One of them, the most, probably the most popular and one most often used and the most tedious is to take every one of these threads, put it on a needle and thread it back through your design to hold it, lock it in place. That's every thread, needle and weave through with every single one. It is tedious and I hate that part. There's another method that you can uh, literally pull the warp threads through, pull them this side and then pull that side and then pull this side and pull that side, fraught with hazards, uh, especially if you had accidentally pierced any of your warp threads. This is a cool way I'm gonna finish up right here. I've already done a few. What I've done was I've taken a couple of the warp threads and tied them in a knot. I don't know if you can see it. See, there's a knot right there, and that one's knotted, that one's knotted, that one's knotted. I'm going to take the next two. So you can see I've knotted a few of them already. Let's see if you can see those knots. Now I'm going to knot this pair right here. And it's just a simple overhand knot. You could do a surgeon's knot to be more, more thorough, square knot. What I'm going to do with this is uh, not, not that earth shattering. So if I just tie any old kind of knot that secures it, I'm comfortable with that. I do make sure it's nice and tight, but don't tie that first knot too tight because as you know, that first knot that's not totally secure, that one could accidentally pull your warp thread so hard, you could pull them out the other side. The fact is on this particular piece, I've already, I've already um, secured the other side of it. So there's no way I can pull these warp threads too, high, too hard. But the first time around, you don't want to pull those too hard. Boy, these are little threads. And I got farmer hands. Little threads, farmer hands. Okay, there we go. Those are all knotted up. I could even add a dot of glue if I felt like I needed to. Don't really need it. I need to terminate these threads, and I like to use a thread burner. Uh, the reason being that when this little tip gets really hot and actually melts the thread, it also makes a little tiny ball of melted thread, and that helps hold my knots in place too. There we go. Isn't that slick? I like the way it just sort of melts the thread a little bit. Oops, I think I just took the knot off of that one. There we go. And then the reason I didn't care about how pretty or nice this is, is because I'm going to use one of these tube ends. This has a hole in the end of it, so my seed beads can slip right into that hole, and I just close the little, clasp, the little latch on it, 
and the end of my bracelet will be done. So just oh, and there's a slot on the side too. See the slot on the side? I think you can see that. Okay, so all I have to do to finish this one is to slide that last row of beads into the tube. Ta-da! Cool! And I'm going to use the handle of my pliers to bend that little end down. Hold it in place. Woohoohoo! Is that slick or what? So easy, so easy to do. Uh, after that, I've added my, my clasp. I've used two jump rings to add a clasp. On this other side, we're also going to be adding the other end. The, you know, bracelets, I'm one of those people who has a little extra stature, so I like my bracelets a little longer than most people. This is going to be way too short for me, but it fit Laura Lynn perfectly. So what I like to do is to add a chain, a chain with fairly large links so that people can hook it wherever they want. And that's great for people who are big, little, in between, any size at all, make your bracelet fit. And just like I did the clasp on the other side, I'm going to use a jump ring. I have twisted it open, always with jump rings, twist open, put on my chain, put onto the end of this clasp, and twist the jump ring closed. And just because I am that kind of person who wears a belt and suspenders, I like a second jump ring. I don't know about you, but when my jewelry fails, it usually fails at the jump ring. And that is because there is a gap in that jump ring. But if you use two jump rings, it's very rare for the gap to line up on both sides and allow this to come apart. Oh, but it'd help if you went through the, the chain. I missed the chain. I went through the loop, not the chain. Hang on. I have skills. I can open up a jump ring again and fix it. <laughs> go through the loop there and go through the chain. Da 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 da. Amazing. There we go. Ta da. Now we've got this nice long chain that people can attach their clasp anywhere they like, but want a little bit fancier yet so I added a tiny little charm because charms are cute and why not and again I've got a little jump ring I have twisted it open I will go through the chain twist it shut and voila we have a completed project A heart, loomed heart bracelet with an extender chain and a little charm. <laughs> now there's an optional addition to this. You could just leave it alone. It's pretty, it's nice. Or you could add this special little edging. That's what gives it that little finishing touch. You don't have to do that, but it looks nice. So let's go and show you how to do that. I've already done a little bit. Of course, you would start at the beginning. I'm just going to continue on. So I've made this little pico edge, pico, 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 all the way over here. And I've just come through this seed bead right here. Can you see it up close? Yeah. I'm going to go through the very next seed bead. Look at that. I even had a needle and thread ready to go for it and I almost forgot to do it. And now I need to pick up, oh, ho, ho, now we're gonna, now we're gonna challenge you. This might be the reason why you don't want to do it. These are size 15 seed beads. These are the smallest ones that Fire Mountain sells. And uh, they can be challenging. If you're visually challenged at all, I am wearing glasses and I'm wearing magnifiers on top of my glasses. So don't feel bad about that at all. I'm one of them. So I'm going to pick up one of the little turquoise ones, one of the green ones, one of the turquoise, and go through the next bead. So I've come out this one. I'm going to go down through that one. 
Ta -da. And there's another little Pico edge. Up through the very next bead. Add a turquoise, a green, and a turquoise, and look how itty bitty those beads are. Oof. Back down to the very next bead. Ta da! And to keep going that way, all the way down the end, all the way back up to the other side. And then, as in most seed bead projects, you'll finish that thread by weaving it in and out of your project until you feel it secure. And that is the project. So I hope you've enjoyed this project and the next Secrets to Seed Bead. Ooh, I have to give you the sneak peek. This is going to be the next one. We're going to stay with that heart theme, but this time it's going to be an un or, no, excuse me, even count peyote stitch. If you want to get into seed beads, you've got to learn peyote stitch. You really do. So this is going to be it. I'm going to copy this one and make it for my favorite nurse. Isn't that a great idea? Can't wait. She's going to love it. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for joining me for episode four. I hope you join me for episode five and all of the other in the 10-part series, Secrets to Seed Beads. My name is Rose. Happy beading. Happy beading.